This is Eugene Brusca, one of the most fascinating Americans in recent memory. That's not a very competitive category, but nevertheless, his story is mildly intriguing. When I look back on it, the saga of Eugene Brusca makes perfect sense. Americans were so opinionated, yet so uninformed. We just yearned for someone to step forward and shut up. That someone was Eugene. I think of Eugene as really the classic man of his age, much like Franklin Delano Roosevelt or Manny Ramirez. He really captured the zeitgeist, which is incredible because the zeitgeist had been on the run for so long, most people thought it was back in Germany. Eugene Brusca had no personality. Zero. In fact, uh, the only notable achievement prior to him becoming a cultural icon is that he never dialed a wrong number in his entire life. And yet, look what he accomplished. So who was Eugene Brusca? In short, Eugene Brusca was a man who had absolutely no opinions on anything. Each day, near his home in Los Angeles, Eugene would read an array of staunch conservative and arch-liberal editorials, then vice versa. Yet after each column, Eugene would inevitably think to himself, Wow, that's something. So if you sleep till noon, do you think that breakfast is still the most important meal of the day? For years, Eugene assumed he was not an opinionated person simply because all the really good opinions were taken. But when he found himself unable to come down pro or con on the subject of famine, he sought professional help in the person of Dr. Saline Flax, a board-certified charlatan who ran a battery of tests on him. Eugene was my most puzzling patient since Evelyn Bibb, a woman still suffering from postpartum depression 27 years after giving birth. At first I thought Eugene had cancer of the self-esteem, but a blood test came back negative. Then I just assumed he was an idiot. But a second blood test ruled that out as well. Finally I had his uh, blood dry cleaned, and at that point I was able to diagnose Eugene with a rare strain of ambivalence. I advise that he avoid other humans. You're unfit for human contact. Don't take it personally. How should I take it? As a group? Yes, that would be easier. Alarmed, Eugene sought a second opinion, but no doctor would see him without a first opinion. Yes, this was a bad time to be an American with no opinions. Have you not been reading the paper? Have you not been turning on the television? I mean, the, the leaders of this country have turned a blind ear to the, to the underpaid, overtaxed, overweight, underachieving, overlooked underclass. The nation was more divided than ever, with some predicting it would soon be subdivided and turned into townhouses. Opinions are good. I mean, you can just say stuff with no consequences. I had an opinion last week. I had just taken the morning after pill, and I thought, nothing in life really happens for a reason. Ashamed, Eugene's effort to conceal his condition became a full-time job, though he could often work at home. His neighbors, such kind people, suspected nothing. Eugene, which one of these dresses do you like? Uh, uh, take the weekend to decide that. At neighborhood cocktail parties, Eugene desperately tried to steer conversation away from politics and back to cocktails. Lindbergh was a Nazi sympathizer. The martini is, is a very popular drink. No, 
he was just a Nazi empathizer. Oh, the younger people, they, they seem to like the mojito. On the rare occasions Eugene joined discussions, it did not go well. Why pay for a war? Some Americans can't put food on the table. Exactly. That's, that's great. Maybe they just don't have the proper utensils. I believe stem cell research could cure multiple sclerosis. Well, there's no question. Mm -hmm. One sclerosis is bad enough, but multiple. These traumas paled next to one presidential election. Usually, after carefully reviewing the policies of the candidates, Eugene voted for whomever was taller. Do you remember that time when they forgot to put the heights of the candidates on the ballot? Well, Eugene didn't know who was tallest, so he just cast a write-in vote. I didn't even run for office that year. I guess I could have assumed the presidency on a part-time basis, but frankly, with the Congress, state dinners, and assassination attempts, who needs it? So when I heard that Eugene had voted for me, I got upset. I called my congressman. Mr. Abdul-Jabbar is one of the best rebounders of all my constituents. So I did some checking. It turned out he didn't fill out the requisite forms to run for president. So I called in a SWAT team from the League of Women Voters. Unnerved, Eugene became something of a hermit. Later, he applied to become an official hermit. When he did venture out, Eugene pixelated his face to remain anonymous. Luckily, it was easy to keep a low profile in an age when everyone craved attention. Excuse me, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. Sad and confused, Eugene considered moving to Cloud Nine, where you can be what you want to be and ain't got no responsibility. Relocating was a daunting prospect, as Eugene had just vacuumed, but frankly, he preferred the more drastic measure of going back to a time when much of the world lived under fascist dictators. In fact, while watching the fall of the Berlin Wall, Eugene said, I, I kind of like communism, you know, except for the money part. That turned out to be the only opinion Eugene ever voiced. Unfortunately, the acoustics were really bad in Berlin at the time. And the Germans turned to him and they said, not now, I'm hammering. Finally, at Eugene's lowest point, something remarkable happened. One day, there was a knock on his door. Eugene tried to pretend he didn't hear the knock, but he wasn't that creative, so he opened the door. Good evening, sir. I work for the Gallup Poll. Do you have opinions on anything? No, I do not. Great. Thank you for your time. Eugene was stunned. He let slip his deepest secret, and nothing happened. Well, that kind of thinking, had he been looking at things all wrong? Is it okay not to have an opinion? Maybe ignorance is a valid point of view. Well, that's when he went to see his acquaintance, Mickey Fowler. Mickey Fowler was an actor who starred in both A and B movies, compiling an overall GPA of 3.2. He now lived on a huge trust fund, thanks to his grandfather, Cyrus Fowler, who in 1909 copyrighted the phrase, no parking anytime. With his vast inheritance, Mickey owned a palatial home in Malibu and a studio apartment in Tulsa. Oh. Oh. What happened to your leg? Oh, tore my ACLU. Oh. 
You know, Eugene, we are destroying this planet. We'll just have to make do without it. At this, Mickey's eyes narrowed, then widened, then went back to their normal size. Eugene, do you support gay marriage? Only for homosexuals. You don't have an opinion on anything, do you, Eugene? No, I do not. Hi, LA Times? Yeah, I want to buy the LA Times. No, 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 not a subscription. The entire paper, I want to buy the LA Times. American Express. Immediately upon purchasing the LA Times, Mickey hired Eugene as a columnist. Every Monday and Friday, 14 column inches of utterly blank space appeared under the byline of Eugene Brusca. The column was an instant sensation. Eugene's column struck a nerve. It tapped into people's souls. It was so readable, and it was so hard to put down. I know, I tried to put it down, but I couldn't put it down. I was inclined to dislike Eugene's column because of my prior experience with him. But I must say, it had a certain quality to it. Eugene came off as someone who was all-seeing, all-knowing. No, more accurately, someone all-seeing, half-knowing. You know, it was like, as a people, we were all working so hard to strengthen these opinions, for these arguments we were never gonna have, with people we were never gonna meet, whose opinions we were never gonna change. But see, then Eugene's column, it transcended all of that. In just six months, Eugene Brusca won the Pulitzer Prize and the good housekeeping seal of tacit approval. Soon, the LA Times upped his column to six days a week, with no visible decline in quality. Oh yeah, editing Eugene's column was a pleasure. Always met his deadlines. Uh, any grammatical mistakes he had were minimal. He made my job easy. With syndication, the column went out to papers in 200 cities, then returned to Los Angeles. Eugene became a fixture on the lecture circuit. At each appearance, he'd stand in front of audiences and say absolutely nothing, followed by a brief question and answer period. Okay, now for some questions. Thank you. Just a reminder, next week we will have an entire evening with J.D. Salinger. And in two weeks, returning, Eugene Bresca. We made a fortune off Eugene. But aren't you a nonprofit organization? Yeah, so what? After queuing up for autographs, audiences invariably went home more at peace in a chaotic world. I'm pretty inspirational. I mean, that, in a lot of different ways. By the way, you know, how, how do you fix for money, okay? Yes, Eugene Brusca was a household name. Even at places of business, he was a household name. Eugene, your money's no good here. Rumor got around that Eugene had written this book called Atlas Shrugged It Off. And when the rumors turned out false, they held book signings for him anyway. People would just bring other people's books for him to sign. However, not everyone 
loved Eugene. According to the Elias Sports Bureau, for every 684 people who liked Eugene, 17 found this column offensive, inflammatory, and dry. In Palo Alto, roving gangs of nebishes tried to steal Eugene's identity until they realized they could have his identity for free. In Texas, confused Baptists called for a fatwa on Eugene, but had to cancel due to scheduling conflicts. Finally, a disgruntled baker named Lee Sarah Booth attacked Eugene with a baguette. Hey, 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 hey! Baker, Baker, get the baguette! Eugene, allergic to wheat, was hospitalized for 20 minutes and released. Lee Sarah Booth escaped. Capturing Mr. Booth was a top priority. Luckily, we had some pretty good intel. We apprehended Booth outside the annual antibiotics show at the Santa Monica Civic Center. He was charged with a hay crime, which was plea bargained down to a he got on my nerves crime. Booth served a, a week in prison during which time he became a white Muslim, lowered his body fat to 9%, and earned his PhD in Elizabethan history. The attack on Eugene only added to his appeal. So much so, a female admirer slipped him her number. It turned out to be her social security number, but Eugene was nonetheless ecstatic. For a while, that is. The attack was the high point for Eugene. He had nowhere to go but down. The handwriting was on the wall. In the next five months, Eugene won a Nobel Prize for Illiterature and the Cy Young Award. But unbeknownst to him, he was morbidly depressed. Yeah, I did notice a change in Eugene. But I couldn't put it into words because I'm not articulate. No, I didn't notice a change in Eugene because I'm self-absorbed. Yes, I noticed a change in Eugene. So what? Whatever the case, Eugene was suddenly a lost soul. Increasingly despondent, Eugene put himself on a 24-hour suicide watch. Remembering he had chores to do, he cut it down to an 11-hour suicide watch. Well, actually, Eugene did try to end his life once by sitting in his car in the garage with the motor running. But he had a Prius, so the attempt failed. Well, Eugene was having a personal crisis. I thought it was my job to try to cheer him up. What the hell's the matter with you? We had no idea what was disturbing him. All we could think of is perhaps he had a chance encounter with a HIV negative teen runaway. Eugene, you're a fucking non-person. Apparently I was unaware of this at the time, but the term fucking non-person still had a negative connotation. And I mean, the media blew it way out of proportion. And I still needed closure, so I decided to sell my story to Us Weekly and hired a publicist, and so now I work at the Rand Corporation. Meanwhile, Eugene set out to find meaning in his life. He arranged a lunch with the Dalai Lama, but when the Tibetan priest said, you pick the place, Eugene canceled. He resumed searching for answers, but all he found were buttons.
Well, with the obesity epidemic in America, buttons were popping off people's clothes everywhere. I mean, I mean, really, man. <laughs> the crap that people eat, you don't know what I'm saying? The body breaks and the body is fine. And I'm open to yours and I'm open to mine. Eugene began having persistent stomach aches. It takes its time, but you'll get over yours, and I'll get over mine. And the sun will shine, and the moon will rise. Finally, one day, Eugene gazed over a glorious floral carbon sunset. Eugene was the first person in the history of the world to gaze at a sunset and actually have an epiphany. People are always gazing at sunsets, hoping to have an epiphany. Usually all they conclude is, nice sunset, or it's chilly out, or they just burn their retinas and go blind. Eugene immediately ran to see his editor. Although he later admitted it would have been faster to drive. The body sways like the wind on a swing, a bridge through a hoop or a lake through a ring. That's yours and mine. When I heard Eugene desperately needed to see me, the hairs in the back of my neck stood up. So I had him trimmed. That's good. Thanks. I invited him in. Eugene. I need to see you. Okay. Well, good seeing you. My column has gotten stale. Well, that's your opinion. That's the first time anyone's ever said that to me. How's it feel? Eugene's column was not stale. Yeah, it may have grown a tab shrill, but hey, it's just uncreative differences. So I begged Eugene not to quit. I tried such classic journalism phrases as, come on, Eugene, and don't be silly, Eugene. But it was no use. So I gave it one final try. Eugene, Eugene! Why don't you try blogging? Isn't blogging for people who can't get paid to write? Well, yeah, but... As word of Eugene's resignation spread, readers expressed their sorrow with a candlelight vigil. But it was ineffective due to it being held during the day. Eugene's resignation was a shock. Suddenly people felt they had to go back to respecting the opinions of others. It was humiliating. <laughs> I was devastated. Eugene mattered to me. I mean, he's the one that taught me that opinions are just accidents. For example, I love guns. In fact, once I, I shot my landlord. But see, if he had shot me, I might very well be anti-gun today. So you see, it's not so hard to be one of us or one of them. So yeah, I was sad. Everyone, everyone was sad. Everyone but Eugene. He took time to recharge his batteries, and though he never found the power port, his spirits lifted. His editors called daily, hoping he'd return to work. Soon, the calls decreased to once a week, then back up to three times a week, before dropping off to the occasional greeting card. In time, wars broke out, tornadoes ravaged suburbia, scandals rocked Wall Street, politicians sucked the marrow out of the state, the poor struggled, the wealthy slept late. Meanwhile, Eugene Brusca went on to become Eugene Brusca, before fading into obscurity 
where he bought a home and lives quietly to this day. If you don't have a song to sing, you're okay. You know how to get along humming. If you don't have a point to make, don't sweat it. You make a sharp one being so kind.